Section 4. You will hear a lecture about wind energy. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33 on page 8. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. With the rising cost of fossil fuels, there's a great deal of interest these days in developing alternative sources of energy. Today, I'd like to talk about one of these, wind power. In the past couple of decades, there's been an upsurge of interest in using the wind as a source of energy, but the idea isn't new at all. People have been harnessing the power of the wind for centuries, ever since ancient peoples first used sailboats. In ancient China, farmers used a rudimentary sort of windmill to pump water. Wind power was used in other parts of the ancient world as well. In Persia, for example, farmers used wind-powered mills to grind their grain. During the Middle Ages, in the Netherlands, people went back to the ancient idea of using the power of the wind to move water. They used windmills to drain lakes, thereby creating more land for farming. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40 on page 9. Now listen carefully and answer questions 34 to 40. At present, people around the world are using the wind to generate electricity. Some old methods, some new. Is this the solution to our modern energy problems? Well, as with anything, there are both advantages and disadvantages to using wind power. Let's take a look at some of the reasons to use wind power. One of the biggest problems with using fuels, such as oil and coal, is pollution. Wind power, on the other hand, is clean. It causes no pollution and therefore doesn't contribute to global warming. Another great advantage of wind power is that it's a renewable resource. Oil and coal reserves are limited, but will never run out of wind. Economics is another reason to use wind power. Using the wind to generate electricity costs less, much less, than running other types of generators. In addition, since wind turbines don't take up much land, the land around them can be used for other purposes, such as farming. There are disadvantages, however. Even though generating electricity with wind is relatively inexpensive, the technology isn't cheap. The initial costs of setting up wind turbines can be quite high. Another issue is reliability. Wind doesn't blow at a constant strength. Therefore, at times, a lot of electricity can be produced, while at others there may be little or none. Wind turbines usually have to be located in rural areas where the land is open. Their distance from cities where the most electricity is needed is another issue. Although wind is considered to be a clean source of energy, Wind turbines cause their own sort of pollution. Wind turbines are usually placed in high, open areas where they're easy to be seen. Rural residents often feel that the beautiful local scenery is spoiled by the sight of the wind turbines. In addition, wind turbines aren't quiet. In fact, one wind turbine can produce as much noise as a car traveling at highway speeds. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about customer psychology. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35 on page 47. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. An understanding of customer psychology is an invaluable aid for retailers looking for ways to increase sales. Much can be done to the store environment to encourage shoppers to linger longer and spend more money. The first aspect to consider is the physical organisation of the store. Placement of merchandise has a great deal of influence on what customers buy. For example, a common practice among retailers is to place the store's best-selling merchandise near the back of the store. In order to get to these popular items from the front entrance, customers have to walk down aisles filled with merchandise that they might not see otherwise. Carpets are also used to direct customers through particular areas of the store. Retailers choose carpets not only for their decorative or comfort value, but also because lines or other types of patterns in the carpets can subtly guide shoppers in certain directions. Besides encouraging shoppers to go to certain areas of the store, retailers also want to keep them in the store longer. One way to do this is to provide comfortable seating throughout the store, but not too close to the doors. This gives customers a chance to rest and then continue shopping. Retailers can do a number of things to create a pleasant atmosphere in the store, thereby encouraging more purchases. Music is commonly used, not as entertainment, but as a calming influence. It can slow the customer's pace through the store, making them spend more time shopping and, consequentially, making more purchases. Scents are also used in various ways. Everyone has had the experience of being drawn into a bakery by the smell of fresh bread. Experiments have been done with other types of scents as well. For example, the scent of vanilla has been used to increase sales in clothing stores. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40 on page 48. Now listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. Use of colour is another important aspect of store environment. Certain colours can affect behaviour as well as mood. Light purple, for example, has been found to have an interesting effect on customer behaviour. People shopping in an environment where light purple is the predominating colour seem to spend money more than shoppers in other environments. Orange is a colour that's often used in fast food restaurants. It encourages customers to leave faster, making room for the next group of diners. Blue, on the other hand, is a calming colour. It gives customers a sense of security, so it's a good colour for any business to use. In addition to using colour to create mood and affect customer behaviour, colour can also be used to attract certain kinds of customers to a business. Stores that cater to a younger clientele should use bold, bright colours, which tend to be attractive to younger people. Stores that are interested in attracting an older clientele will have more success with soft, subtle colours, as older people find these colours more appealing. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a professor give a lecture on Louisa May Alcott. First, you have some time to look at the questions 31 to 40 on page 87.
Now listen carefully and complete the timeline in questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Today I'd like to continue our discussion of the lives of prominent American writers by talking about Louisa May Alcott, one of the best-known 19th century writers. Alcott is known for her moralistic girls' novels, but she was a much more serious individual than those novels might lead one to believe. She was born in 1832, the daughter of Bronson Alcott, who was one of the founders of the Transcendentalist movement. Bronson Alcott was a philosopher, but not a provider, and the family lived close to poverty. From an early age, Louisa was determined to find a way to improve her family's economic situation. As a teenager, she worked to support her family by taking on a variety of low-paying jobs, including teacher, seamstress, and household servant. Alcott also started writing when she was young. She wrote her first novel when she was just 17 years old, although it wasn't published until many years after her death. It was called The Inheritance. In 1861, the Civil War broke out. Alcott worked as a volunteer, sewing uniforms and bandages for soldiers. The following year, she enlisted as an army nurse. She spent the war years in Washington, nursing wounded soldiers at a military hospital. While working at the hospital, she wrote many letters to her family at home in Massachusetts. After the war, she turned the letters into a book, which was published under the title Hospital Sketches. She also wrote numerous romantic stories, which she sold to magazines. Around this same time, she was offered the opportunity to travel to Europe as the companion to an invalid. When she returned home from Europe in 1866, she found her family still in financial difficulty and in need of money. So she went back to writing. Her big break came in 1868, with the publication of her first novel for girls, Little Women. The novel achieved instant success, and the public wanted more. From then on, Alcott supported herself and her family by writing novels for girls. It wasn't the writing she had dreamed of doing, but it earned her a good income. Alcott took care of her family for the rest of her life. In 1878, her youngest sister May got married. A year later, May died after giving birth to a daughter. Louisa Alcott raised her sister's orphaned child. In 1882, Bronson Alcott suffered a stroke. Soon after that, Louisa Alcott set up a house for him, her niece, her sister Anna, and Anna's two sons in Boston. Her mother was no longer living by this time. Alcott was still writing novels for girls, including two sequels to Little Women, Little Men and Joe's Boys. The latter was published in 1886. Louisa Alcott had suffered poor health ever since she contracted typhoid fever while working as a war nurse. She died in March of 1888, at the age of 55. She was buried in Concord, Massachusetts. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about the black bear. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35 on page 126. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. The black bear, or Ursus americanus, has a wide range inhabiting forested areas of North America, including Canada, the United States, and parts of northern Mexico. Black bears are omnivores, getting their nutrition from a wide variety of plants and animals. The particular foods any one bear eats depends on what's available in the area where that bear lives. 
as well as on the season of the year. Generally speaking, plant foods make up 90% of the bear's diet. The rest of its meals consist of animal foods, such as insects and fish. Bears have a relatively long gestation period. Mating takes place in the spring or early summer, but bear cubs aren't born until the following winter. Usually, two cubs are born at a time, although some litters may have as many as five cubs. Bear cubs are dependent on their mother and may stay with her for close to two years. Wild black bears can live as long as 25 years. They've lived for as long as 30 years or more in captivity. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40 on page 126. Now listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. Much of the black bear's range coincides with the range of its close cousin, the grizzly bear. Although these bears are somewhat similar in appearance and habits, it isn't difficult to tell the difference between them. Colour isn't necessarily a distinguishing characteristic, as both species of bears occur in a range of colours from almost blonde to dark brown or black. Many black bears, however, have a patch of fur on their chests that's lighter in colour than the rest of their fur. Grizzly bears don't have this patch. Size isn't always a distinguishing feature either, although grizzly bears are usually heavier with an average weight of 225 kilos. Black bears average 140 kilos in weight. Grizzly bears spend time digging in the ground for roots and tubers that make up part of their diet. The large muscles they need for this give them a distinct shoulder hump. This hump is absent in black bears, which don't do the same kind of digging. The shape of the face and ears is also different in each species of bear. Grizzly bears have a depression between the eyes and nose and short round ears. Black bears, on the other hand, have a straighter profile and longer, more pointed ears. Grizzly bears are known for their fearsome, long, sharp claws. Black bears have shorter claws, which are better suited for climbing trees. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.